The goal in your life is not to figure out how to be comfortable in your mental prisons, but to realize that you have the keys to set yourself free. Hey everybody, welcome to How to Be Mesmerizing. It's Tim Schur and today I have another fabulous guest. I'm so excited. Jesse States is with us today. Jesse, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. I am ecstatic to be here. Uh, well, thank you. I really appreciate you making time. So for anybody that doesn't know, Jesse is a legend in the meeting and events uh, field. So she is in charge, if you've ever heard of Meeting Planners International. Well, she's in charge of the training. She's the director of their academy. So basically, she's teaching the best meeting planners in the world how to be awesome and how to create spectacular experiences for their attendees. And Jesse's the one that people turn to. So that's why when we met, I'm like, I've got to get you on the program and gain some wisdom from you. So, and I know you're so humble. You're like, I don't know, but She's been, she's been given the pace setter award. She was on the, you know, voted as the 25 most in one of the 25 most influential people in the meetings and events industry. But if you talk to her, she's like, yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> I love your humility. So, Thank you. so anyway, yeah. So I'm excited you're here. So tell me, how did you become the director of the MPI Academy? Cause that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, it is. And, and my, um, my experience in the industry kind of took me in many different places. I actually joined MPI as a writer, as a storyteller on their publications team. So I was going around the world telling the stories of all these amazing experiences. And then I really started to want to think about what the science was behind all of that. Why was it happening? And was there, were there methodologies to the madness of creating these extraordinary events? And that really led me into doing a lot of research here at NPI, working on a lot of research projects that we were working on at that time. This was back a decade or more ago. And really looking at what the future of meetings was going to be. How do we really strategize around the design of experiences? How do we create behavior change for audiences? And once we created all of this research, we had hundreds of thousands of papers of uh, pages of research in these different areas and nobody was downloading it or reading it mm -hmm. so it really became about t telling stories in a different way it went from kind of writing stories to then creating educational stories so taking this research and really making it applicable to meeting and event professionals utilizing educational means and yeah. from there I just worked my way through the education teams the events teams and everything else here at MPI into this role that's brilliant. So you're right. We're so inundated with so much information. You know, it's, it's not like someone says, oh, good, I get to read another article, <laughs> right? Because even though you and I are constantly writing them, there's, there's so much information. So you were able to repackage it and tell your stories in a way where people are like, that relates to me. I get real value out of this. Because as they say, even if you get one golden idea, one nugget, then it was totally worth it. And right. so... So have you noticed, how's the industry tr industry changed over the, like the last 10 years or so? And with technology and, and the way that people are wanting to travel and, and some of the resistance people have to doing face-to-face, -face, you know, interactions and conferences. So, so what are some of the things that you've seen in the stories over the last few years? I think we're seeing a real shift uh, from organizations, businesses, and meeting professionals in the why behind their meetings and events. Mm -hmm. And being very, very mindful and thoughtful about why and how we bring people together and when, and whether that's necessary or not. And then really strategizing about what that experience needs to be in order to drive behavior change for businesses or growth for industries. So if we're going to take all of the, the time out of the office, the expense of hosting an event, uh, if we're going to do all of those things, then we have to be really sure that our fiduciary responsibility to our organizations is being met, that this is something where people have to come together. And and really that that strategy is something that I think may have been missing on, on many parts uh, ahead of even the Great Recession. But now there's a real impetus on proving the value of these experiences. 
Yeah, that is really powerful. I love how you said that. You know, we should always know our why. You know, they always say, have a why that's so big it makes you cry. <laughs> and I love so, that. Yeah. And so, the, uh, you know, knowing why, and, and you're right, I've heard that before too. People before would just have meetings just to have them or to show off right? Or just, you know, somewhere where you're going to go and it was more tactical. It was just about, you know, the things that you were going to learn or the fancy speakers that were going to be there. And now it seems like it's changing and it's more about people are excited about the side conversations that are happening in the hallways on the way to the next breakout. That That's where the magic is. And so now if you're much more intentional about creating these face-to-face -face experiences, um, so Obviously, I've been doing a lot of writing on this and, and writing articles for, um, for MPI myself. And so um, let me ask you this question. Uh, the question is, when, you are, um, when you're um, setting up these experiences for people to have these face-to-face -face, face -face encounters, um, how, are you, how are you helping people to know that that's why you should have your meetings? Did, you, did that make sense? I have my question. It's just kind of mixed so. up in my head. Because <laughs> I know it's important. You should, you should set up your, your uh, meetings so that people are purposely having those face-to-face -face interactions instead of feeling like, um, well, we can just do it over a webinar. Because it's completely and some things different. can be done over a webinar or a podcast like we're doing right now. So how are we choosing the right opportunities and the right mediums for the delivery of experience and the transfer of knowledge? If, if, if it is simply just uh, your organization needs to get a message out to people, then yeah. is that the right type of thing? Do we need to bring everybody in together to share something one way? Yeah. Or is that something we can share virtually or digitally via an email or a podcast or even a webinar or webcast? When we intentionally bring people together, uh, there, should be, there should be intention around that. There should be strategy around that. And there should be more than just one-way communication because that's not what a meeting is. Oh, see, now as I fumbled to get the answer across, you so eloquently just – Yes, this, and that. I'm not even going to try to repeat back what you said because it was so smooth and nice and polished. So I love that. So um, I think you hit it right, nail on the head, right? This isn't if I, I do a program called Mesmerizing Meetings, you know, and, and uh, just for companies, you know, whether they should have a meeting itself, just, you know, a one o'clock meeting, not something that's, mm. you know, a big one. But and a big question is if you're just going to offer a review, send that out in a document, don't have a meeting for it. Or like you said, if you're going to, um, if it's going to be a one-way conversation, that's not really a good use of your funds. You know, just do it through some other communication like, you know, a, a webinar or, or a recorded video or just an um, Excel sheet, right? So let people have their free time you know, and don't eat it up with meetings. However, on the flip side, if it is going to be a two-way conversation, if people are looking to collaborate, if they're looking to gain ideas from other people and borrow innovative ideas, if they are wanting to just lean on each other for support, because if you're not a meeting planner, you can't really understand the pressures that meeting planners go through. And when you're in the business, you're like, oh, I totally get that. And that feeling of support is also huge. So um, as we move forward in, uh, you know, meetings in the new decade, um, are there some trends that you're seeing that, uh, that are causing more people to be excited about uh, meetings or events? Or is it the same, well, same kind that, of thing? Yeah, I think that the experience economy has crashed right into our industry. Yeah. Uh, and that uh, as we continue to look at ways in which we create experiences that drive business for our organizations. It is that. Uh, we're using and seeing less of this kind of the, the meetings and events terminology and the more of the uh, we're designing an experience. Uh, and, and that's what people are buying into now and it's what they expect. So yeah. we're, we're continuing to see the, the experience uh, economy and, and that, 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 that need uh, to not just meet with each other but to share something together. Uh, that's really driving growth in our business. Yeah. That's really uh, powerful. I've always known that shared experiences, you know, as a therapist, people, um, people don't change just from getting more information. They transform by going through uh, some kind of powerful emotional experience. Really? And so when you're in a group or you're having a meeting, the whole point is to take people through these ex shared experiences that you're talking about. The technology might be a little different. They might be trying on virtual, 
you know, headsets or, you know, other screen technology and the things that they have. But at the end of the day, the thing that we're always needing more of is having shared experiences where people can actually go mm-hmm. through planned events, planned things. I love your terminology, designing experiences, right? Whether it's fireside chats or table topics or mastermind groups or, you know, there's lots of things that people can do. But the point is to um, create strategic ways to keep the conversation going so that you're doing as much talking as you are listening when you're at an event. Yes. Yes. So and, and also practicing together uh, mm-hmm. in order to enable learning, you know, so you, you're looking at two things. You're looking at the learning experience. You're looking at the kind of social experience. You're looking at the, uh, the places where the Venn diagram uh, comes together, where it's both the social learning experience. Yeah. Uh, you're looking at all of these experiences and then you're, what you're really trying to do is drive some kind of behavior change among a group of people. And if they're able to work together towards that, then they're much more likely to apply something that they've learned. It's one thing to remember something or recall it. Those are the lowest levels of learning, but being able to to take something and think about the context of it and then apply that back or at the kind of top level, being able to create something altogether new out of something that you've learned in order to drive that kind of knowledge base and that kind of growth in education, uh, you've really got to just, you, you have to plan experiences as opposed to a traditional learning environments. That is awesome. So that's a three-step approach for designing experiences. So practice together. So what would they practice together? What are ideas? What were, would be things that people would practice? Anything that they're anything that they're learning within an educational event, you don't want them to leave without having experienced it in some way. So whether they're applying that to something that they do on a daily basis while they are in the learning experience or they're practicing some kind of activation together, Mm. or they're looking at how they can take that particular learning and then really utilize it to to provide change for their business. That should be taking place on site as well. So anytime you've got a learning experience, there should be some delivery of knowledge, something net new that they're learning, but then how are they actually taking that and thinking about how it can be applied while they're in that space and then sharing that application with their fellow learners that's where the real learning is going to take place. So that is spectacular. Oh, that's so good. Because I don't see a lot of that happening. Most of it is still lecture based, right? Going off the PowerPoints or occasionally, you know, people, someone will be funny, you know, but most of it, when I go and I see these speakers, a lot of them are just boring. The, mm-hmm. the introduction, the, the hype, you know, it sounds really exciting. And then you see them on stage and it's a yawn fest. I'm like, ah. Oh, and so my programs are almost all of them are interactive. Yeah. I'll, I'll teach something and then we're doing it right there because that's the way that you keep it fun and exciting and people entertain themselves. They're way funnier than I am. I just set them up. <laughs> right. And yes. so, you know, just <laughs> smiling, you? you know, look at your partner and give them the biggest smile you can, you know, and then everybody cracks up and, but then you learn from that. Right. And so I love that. So you practice together and then that's what drives the behavioral change. So, and then of course, getting them to apply it when they go home, your three steps. That's awesome. And then, okay. So, um, uh, so what would you say are some things that you've learned from being in this business that you wish you would have known when you first started? Oh, some things that I've learned in this business that I wish I had known when I started. Sorry, I'm I'm gonna take a second on that one to think of that. That's good. Uh, that's you know now my brain's really working on this. <laughs> I th- I think I would I think that I would have. I wish earlier on I had reached out to more people for kind of mentorship opportunities. Mm, nice. I, I think early on in my career I didn't realize because we are in a people industry how willing others are able to help um, to advance both the industry and people's careers. And I I wish early on I had known it was so easy just to reach out and seek advice or ask for help or really just learn from somebody else. Um, Everybody has been so incredibly willing to just step up and enable others. Mm -hmm. And, And 
I don't think that is true necessarily in many other places or many other industries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you speak to a lot of different industries, so you might even you might even see this as well. Yeah, there's a lot more competition than cooperation and collaboration. But in this business, I've seen the same thing. Whenever I've spoken at an MPI event or any event where there's planners around or planners involved, it, um, you know, they're definitely willing to help out, right? And there's some very talented people and everybody has a big heart. Everybody wants to do a good job. And so you just got to ask. And sometimes people get shy, you know, or they don't want to come across as, as, you know, not knowing, you know, we want to, our ego gets in the way. But I think that's a, a brilliant piece of advice across the board, you know, seek out some mentors and people that can help you or protect you from, you know, making mistakes. If they can shorten your learning curve. Yes. Yes. I mean, any, any day of the week, do that. <laughs> yeah. I think that the other thing that I wish that I had known was that, um, that leadership happens at all levels. Yeah. I, I, you know, just coming into the career, just coming into the industry, I kind of thought, you know, uh, you had to have a certain level or you had to be at a certain uh, rank or you had to be somewhere within the hierarchy to be a leader. And that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're all leaders. Every, every person is a leader. We all have different leadership skills. We all have different abilities to apply that leadership across our organizations, our family units, our communities, our friends, all of those things. And I, I just wish that I had known that, that just because you don't have the title doesn't mean that you're not a leader and that you don't have something to contribute. Mm, that is brilliant. That's exactly right. Because we're always a leader of ourselves. Right. And, and it's not what shows up. It's how we show up. Right. Yeah. And, and so I love the idea that, um, you know, it's important to feel like you can add value and you can contribute and you are a leader regardless of what your title may be. And uh, when people step into that and own that, it's amazing how they show up. And of course, you know, the more value you bring, the more valuable you become. So if you are showing up saying, hey, I have something to offer or I have some my opinion or Right. I'm willing to um, or even, you know, I don't know a lot, but I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to ask the questions that other people are afraid to ask. And then we can all benefit from that. I mean, there's lots of ways to show up yeah. and be a leader. Yes, I think that's wonderful. So tell me about your storytelling. How did you end up uh, being a storyteller? I my <laughs> I fell into it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, my um, initially my um, my career or my my student path in, at university was was going to be I was going through theater school, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, which is telling a story on yeah, a stage. You bet. Uh, and then I went on sabbatical from that. <laughs> came back to school, went through a bunch of different majors until I ended up in journalism. Okay. Yeah. And telling stories through writing, and then starting here on the magazine telling stories through writing, and then moving into research, telling stories through education, telling stories through meetings and events. You know, it's just, I think that everything that we do in our industry really is a story. We're writing a story. We're asking our participants to participate in a story, you know, and, and, and what that end is is something that we collectively generate. Uh, and, and so I, I, storytelling to me is, is everything to do with meetings and events. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you get a group of people who are creating a story in real time. Yes. Memories about it. I heard someone say that we're not happy in the moment. We're happy after when we review the moments. <laughs> you know, so. I really um, like that. Yeah, yeah. I think it was um, Russell Brunson. He's, a, he's a, an internet marketer and a really amazing guy. And, and he said that um, he'll look at pictures of his kids with his wife. And they'll be so cute and he'll say, oh, you remember this? And, and they'll be so happy looking at the picture. And then his wife will say, yeah, you remember that? That was <laughs> right, after, right after she was throwing up all night long on our vacation and we didn't get any sleep that night. And they're like, oh, yeah, I forgot. But isn't the picture so cute? <laughs> you know, so sometimes it's, you know, we're like the travel and the lack of sleep and everything else. But we look back and we're like, that was a great experience. I can't wait to go again. Yes. So I love that idea of, you know, it's all a story and we're narrating the story as we go along. And then as meeting planners, you want to help guide the narration of that story and just kind of set up the scene and then let it unfold as it will. Yeah. Setting the stage. Yes. Oh, 
that's well it makes sense that you would end up doing something where you're telling stories because you're so creative and expressive and passionate that um that it makes sense that you would end up being someone who would put people in these magical states and uh and yeah take them on a on a ride yeah. so that sounds really cool that you were able to to you know did you say you were traveling around or were you just writing stories about people from around the world no, uh, back back in back when I was on the publications team here at MPI, it, it, uh, many events would bring us out to kind of tell the story of their their meetings while it's happening. Or destination oh, might wow. want us to come out to to kind of showcase what the story of what that destination could offer, you know. And so, wow. um, early on, there was a bit of travel associated yeah. with with that storytelling. Yeah, yeah. How cool! I just imagine you like on. Oh, no, National Geographic, you got a backpack on. <laughs> you know, you're going to all these events, you're writing everything down. Storytelling <laughs> notebook, yeah. That's right, that's right. Oh my gosh. So that had to be fun because what? when you're telling stories and people are re relying on you, of course, you know, you want to make it seem magical and, you know, a must a must kind of a must attend, you know, experience. Were there any uh, particular themes or things that uh, stood out? from all those experiences that you've had? In what, in, in, in what way? So like um, they had uh, an event that I spoke at in Indianapolis and it was all about um, uh, celebrities, right? And they had the red carpet and they had cardboard cutouts of like Brad Pitt and, and Angelina, you know, and people were taking pictures with them and you walked in and it just looked like Hollywood. And I thought that was a really clever theme. And they just had all these different fun, special things that added to the Hollywood theme. And I thought that's very clever. So they probably got themes for all kinds of stuff going on. All yeah, over the world. I imagine so. And I can't, what, I don't have one that necessarily pops out, but the ones that I've always enjoyed the most mm -hmm. are the ones that really capitalize on the location of the event itself, really okay. driving home why yeah. we're here. Yeah. Uh, it, particular destination. If I'm going to fly people in from all over the world to attend this meeting or event, then yeah. I want to explain to them or help them understand why it's here. And yeah. and so I love I love it any time an organization really embraces the destination. I think that those are the best kinds of experiences. Oh yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense because they're probably taking you to um you know, off-site things where you can go and experience the culture and the activities and the things that are around because it makes it exciting then, right? Absolutely. If you create enough space where people can actually relax and have some fun instead of just meeting after meeting after meeting and sitting in a chair for hours on end, that puts people it in a trance. Healthy for the, it's, not healthy, it's not a healthy learning experience. It's not healthy mm -hmm. for the brain. It's not enabling any kind of reflection time at all. To yeah. have back-to-back -back meetings like that is just, you're just setting yourself up for an unsuccessful experience. Yeah. So if there was one bit of advice, if someone was new coming into the business, um, let's do this both ways. If someone was new coming into the business, I know one of the things that you said is find a mentor. Is there another idea that you might have for them that would help them to start to get a jump start on things? Would it be too self-serving to say join an association? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, and I won't even say MPI. Just find the right community for you. Yeah. And there are a lot of amazing associations in our industry. Yeah. Um, find the one that makes the most sense for where it is that you want to go or that has the community that you really feel like this is home. Yeah. And join an association and find your peers. Uh, they're going to help you to learn. They're going to help you to explore. The, the best leadership training you could possibly find is by joining a, uh, the volunteer uh, leadership at a local organization near you. Um, that's the way that you truly advance your career and really talk about the skills that are necessary to kind of like advance into new roles. You can find all of that through an association. So my biggest piece of advice would be to find the right community, and invest in yourself by joining it. That's really good. I mean, that's why we have associations, right? So that people who are in the same situation can come together and support one another. I mean, that's the power of, of being a, a member of MPI or any of the other programs that are out there. And I, I think meeting planning, uh, you know, above and beyond many other career types, 
it's so difficult to explain to our to our communities and to our families you, you know it's so misunderstood what we do yeah. and having that support system of people who get you yeah. and understand what you're going through without yeah. having to kind of try to explain it to people who don't is just there's there's nothing better than that so what is the misconception What's well, the, the misconception of, uh, amongst people from outside of our industry is going to be that the, 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 the job is, you know, planning parties uh, or that it's, it's relatively easy to do, um, mm -hmm. that it's, oh, you get to travel all over the world, how exciting, without yeah. knowing that sometimes you don't see outside of a hotel room or, you know, <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I, you know, I went to Barcelona, but I, I got out one night and that was it, the rest of it was in the conference center. You know, those types of things are, are n incomprehensible uh, to people outside of our industry and also the amount of stress that meeting professionals are under. You yeah. know, top five stressful jobs in the world. You've got military, police, you know, paramedics. Um, and then, then you got meeting professional, right? And so it, really? while it can from the outside be Instagrammable moments of seemingly fun, fun, fun times, uh, so sometimes our families and our communities don't necessarily understand the, the actual work itself. So why do you think it is so uh, stressful and demanding then? Well, it's a perfectionist industry. I think you know, uh, you are con you are not only responsible for um, you know the the tactics of the job of of pulling this off, but of every single attendee's experience. On top of that, you're trying to create business value, growth, behavior change for your business. You're you're looking at how meetings are are changing the company's growth. Uh, how it's impacting KPIs, all of the things that your business is utilizing these events to do, that's also on you to not only pull that off, but to also measure it uh, and, and to ensure the on-site experience of all of these people with whom uh, Judy of Care is entrusted on you. So there, <laughs> there are a lot of things to be stressful about. Yeah, yeah, that is a lot. It's a lot. Of course, again, it's not what we go through, it's how we experience it, right? So if you decide that um, the reason that you're in that position is because you're great at doing that, you're great at facilitating relationships because every part of it is really about the conversations you're having, the communication that you're having, you know, or you're making sure that there's not a lack of the communication, you know, and then just helping people design these experiences and pulling it out of them. A lot of times I think meeting planners put it all on their own shoulders or I got to do all of this and it has to be perfect. And if I, I can't make a mistake and, and I'm always like, people support what they co-create. So you want to, you know, enroll lots of different people into helping you to throw this party, right? And into yes. creating this, uh, designing this experience, because then not only will you increase engagement and, um, and attendance, but also you'll have people who are more invested in making it a fantastic experience because they felt like they had a part to play in it. Absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah. So, you know, we definitely put pressure on ourselves. And uh, yeah, there's definitely going to be things that are going on and lots of things that people have to juggle. Um, but on the other end of it, the reason that most people are doing this is because they're good at it, right? They're drawn to it. And, and so anybody that's listening, I want you to be proud of yourself. So if it's yeah. a little, if you're in demand right now, because I don't like that busy word, you know, how you doing? <laughs> busy, busy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't in like that B word. I'd rather be in demand. <laughs> in demand. In demand. Yeah. So, you know, you're in demand because you're a pretty big deal and you can pull this off and that's why you're in that position. So good for you. <laughs> my colleague says that my schedule is disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. That's really funny. It certainly can be, right? It starts yeah. to get a little ridiculous sometimes. <laughs> But, you know, it's all about taking charge of our schedule instead of yes. letting it charge us. And so, um, uh, and I think a big part of that is scheduling some fun and me time. They talk about work-life balance. I don't know how you balance that. Sometimes you got to really dig in and there's no balance. The balance comes when you schedule in fun for yourself. So I think it's work-fun balance, right? Oh, you, that's interesting. Tell me more about this. So if you, yeah, so if you schedule some, um, I'm glad you like that because that was the first article I was submitting for the MPI. 
<laughs> in January. <laughs> so I'm glad you enjoy it. <laughs> but I was talking about the um, uh, how we have to have some fun and create fun experiences because often we'll create me time and you know what we do with me time? Laundry, straightening up the house, paying the bills, getting caught up on all the stuff we didn't have time to do. And that's not enough. That doesn't do it. But if you have um, work fun balance, then you can have a lot of fun in a short amount of time and it'll recharge your batteries quickly so mm. that you can go back and start working again. Because for a lot of us, our work is also our hobby, right? We love doing it. We love doing what we're doing and the people that are involved. And so we don't mind working hard, but you got to have that time for fun. And I think that a lot of us are just ADD, adventure deficit disorder. We don't have enough fun in our, in our life, enough adventure, enough real connection. And, uh, and sometimes we get so lost that we don't know what to do. So we just don't do it. You know, we just keep working. So how do you, so no, now see, I'm going to flip this around. Suddenly <laughs> I'm going to start interviewing you. But um, so how do you, how do you schedule this? And, and how do you, I mean, if you only have, let's say we have half an hour, start funning. Like, <laughs> start <laughs> funning. That look like? <laughs> That's great. All right. So you got a half hour. What can you do? You can call somebody. They have these chair massage services that will literally come to your office. You can get a 15 minute chair massage, right? You can go on YouTube and listen to one of their millions of, of um, uh, hypnotic stress release programs or guided meditation programs. Just find the voice that you like and the affirmations and then you can sit back and, and take 20 minutes, close your eyes. There's an old expression that says, when you learn to go within, you never go without. And so a lot of times we think that our fun is out there, but you can actually, you know, find it in here just by closing, closing your eyes, taking some power breaths in and listening to one of these guided meditations. And 20 minutes later, you'll feel renewed, refreshed, rejuvenated. You'll feel like, wow, I actually feel pretty good. You can get up and do a little stretching. I call it my, um, uh, I put together a, a sanity and health inventory toolbox. So it's my shit kit. <laughs> and yeah. so when it hits the fan, right, <laughs> what you do, <laughs> okay? And what you do is you, uh, you know, you have a playlist of songs that you enjoy, something you listen to in high school that makes you feel good, that brings up happy memories, uh, a series of short couple minute videos on YouTube that crack you up or that inspire you, maybe some aromatherapy candles or aromatherapy oil like lavender, you know, that'll help you feel relaxed and take the edge off. Um, you can have a couple of numbers of friends that always make you smile or that will listen to you or, or that'll make you laugh and so you can call them. Um, you can get out a couple of thank you cards. I have a friend that calls, he has a system, it's called ROR, Return on Relationships. And he has the, he talks about sending out care cards where you just get out a couple of cards and you write a thank you letter, handwritten to somebody that you appreciate. And then you just really focus on, you know, I really appreciate our friendship or I really appreciate how you're always there for me or I appreciate that idea, you know, that you shared with me and you write down some care cards and you get into that spirit of gratitude and then you send it off. And that way you're just taking that half hour and you're finding all kinds of different ways that you can have fun that don't take extra time, extra money, extra effort, and that you can start to do right where you are. And so a lot of times we tell ourselves, I don't have time because, you know, and then they're looking for all the reasons why it won't work. Mm -hmm. So whatever you look for hard enough, you're going to find. So if you start looking for reasons for what you can do and why it will happen, then it will. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you for that bite-sized lesson. I'm going to start doing care cards. Care I cards love are love care it. cards are beautiful. Yeah, care cards are beautiful. And so, you know, or you just think about uh, sending little personalized gifts. It doesn't. It can be small, but just something. You know, when you get something unexpected in the mail from someone who says, "Hey, I really appreciate you," and and you were talking about this, or I saw a picture on your wall, and I noticed you like that, so I hope you like this. And it, it could be anything. I have a friend that. Um, he said there was this guy that he loves his podcast and he's always listening to it. And, um, and he was always talking about his dream car was this yellow beetle, right? This, this Volkswagen bug. And, uh, and so my friend had someone on Fiverr or something like that, draw a picture of the exact car with that guy in it. And then he framed it and he sent it to him. Probably cost him 30 bucks, you know, shipping and everything. And, uh, but the guy like lost his mind. He's like, this is the best present I've ever had. You know, and he started saying, how can I help you? And uh, that wasn't the point. The point was just to offer gratitude. 
but people are so touched by it because we're not taking the time to appreciate one another in the way that we could that it is mesmerizing and uh, and people want to reciprocate and then that's what it's all about we keep helping each other and uh, right. and then it makes it fun and then it's not so stressful anymore you know no one no one says that we have to be stressed <laughs> i think we're just in the habit of it you know we're in the habit of having so much going on that we start to fall into this groove and then uh, our story of what we're doing starts to change and we need to be mindful of the story we're telling ourselves and that's why you know we're talking about designing experiences well not just the event stories. huh and By telling stories telling stories you said it exactly right we got to modify the story we're telling ourselves and design a new experience for how we plan experiences so that we're having fun along the ride and right. not just afterwards that would be something that would be something yeah <laughs> we're going to do that yeah well, I think, you know, in so many ways we have already, just from the advice that you've given. I mean, there are so many wonderful things that you've talked about, designing experiences. You know, you're not a meeting planner anymore, an event planner anymore. You're a designer of experiences. You know, you're someone who creates joy and passion and connection and collaboration and breakthroughs. You know, you're a breakthrough designer, you know, and you yeah. start to elevate what you call yourself. So I work with, uh, I remember a, a friend of mine, Carrie, I've done a lot of programs with human resources directors over the years, and um, they used to call themselves just HR directors. And now she's the, she's the director of employee experiences. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Elevated her title. So let me ask you this then, with all the wisdom that you have, all the, uh, the stories that you've collected over the years, what would be some advice if you could go back and talk to that little girl that you once were, what advice would you give her about her future? Oh, gosh, I wish I had more confidence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that's the one thing that, that I, I would tell any person, whether it's a young person or it's someone early on in their career, confidence is so crucial. Um, and, and I think that took me a long time to kind of realize how critical it is, particularly in the business environment. That whole fake it till you make it scenario. I mean, I, I hate to put it as cliche as that, but it's true. And the confidence that you put out into your job, into the marketplace with your attendees or your business owners, that confidence shows who you are and that that is contagious. Yeah. Uh, and it's so, so critical to be to be confident in yourself. Oh, so much so. I love that. I think that's wonderful. And you know, it's interesting because sometimes people think that confidence is the absence of fear, but it isn't. In fact, you got to have some stress. <laughs> no, to be confident. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome to feel confident. And um, where do you think confidence comes from? I think confidence comes from an acceptance that failure is okay. Yeah. Yeah. I like to think there is no failure. It's just feedback. Yeah. Just feedback. It and, and it's, sometimes it's, it's something that's so key to success. Um, and so realizing that you can try things and that sometimes they're not going to work and that you're accepting of that and that it's okay and that it, you're taking lessons from that experience or that failure or mistake and it's making your business better. Um, sorry about that. For just a second, I cut out. So It's okay. <laughs> but um, yes, so I, I feel like confidence comes from the acceptance that failure is inevitable. Yeah, yeah, and that it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, an old um, an old therapy trick is just to kind of blow it out and get to the worst of you know what if this happens? What if that happens? Oh, I'm going to end up living in a van down by the river, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then I what? I always tell myself and, and my team, okay, we're we're what's the worst thing? Yeah, we're okay with that worst thing. Yeah. Then then we're fine. Then you're free. It liberates you. Mm -hmm. Very clever. Very clever. Uh, this has been so good. So if there, um, um, if there was a, um, a bit of advice that you would want to leave everybody with today that they could hold on to or, or that would inspire them, what would it be for you? I, I think experiment. 
Ooh. try new things, try different things, whether that's within your career, whether that's within your meetings and events, yeah. um, whether that's with your families, just, just be, try to step outside of your comfort zone. My friend, Karen Crow, um, who's a, an incredible uh, event planner and, and, and strategist. She says, you want to get yourself and your attendees out of their comfort zone. That's where they're going to have the experience that's meaningful, where they're going to learn something new. You don't want to get them to their crisis zone, though. You want them to be somewhere outside of their comfort zone without getting to where they're too scared to experience something. And so getting, getting that, 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 that middle ground of outside of the comfort zone and, and utilizing that ground to, to try something new or different. You know, and if that's, if that's scalable, that's okay. So maybe you experiment with something small. If it doesn't work out, uh, it's not a critical business thing. It's not going to cost a lot of money and it doesn't take a lot of time. And then it's easily scaled up. So something that's successful can then, then become part, a critical part of business. But, but having that, being able to experiment and, and try new things, particularly within the meeting and event space, I think is something that is not doesn't come easy to us because back to what we were talking about before, everything has to be perfect or in our minds, it has to be perfect. And so we're not necessarily known as first adopters because we want to see something practiced out over time so that it, we can see how it can be done successfully and then we're comfortable perhaps experimenting with it. Um, but trying every once in a while, I think, to step outside of that and look at things a little bit differently. That's awesome. I really like that a lot. I mean, you said it beautifully. And, and it's very clever, you know, experiment, try new things, and then, uh, but don't go too crazy because it might freak you out. You, know, <laughs> you don't have to get out of your comfort zone, just expand it a little bit more. I like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it'll build up. Happen. Yeah, because then it'll make you a little bit more courageous trying something else again. Yeah. As opposed to going too crazy and then going, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> That was, that would that didn't work, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, Make just- sure that you can experiment, you know, you set yourself up for success. Don't try anything too, too outside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, you can ask other people, I guess, you know, what's the craziest thing you've ever done? You know, or, or how have you experimented? What are some wild things? And what have you learned from that? I think, again, that's the value. That would be a pretty funny article, actually. That'd be a good story. I want to hear what the craziest thing you've ever done is. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to stop recording for that. So. <laughs> Not fair. Yeah, that's awesome. So, Jesse, this has been outstanding. The time has just flown by. And uh, I've got so I took so many wonderful notes just uh, of all the things that you've said. So I, I really appreciate um, all your wisdom and, and everything that you've shared. So. Is there anything in particular that you want to uh, promote, you know, or, or uh, drive traffic to? Well, I would love for anyone who is interested or feels like it, it would be compelling to their, to their careers or to their meetings to come and join us outside of um, uh, uh, right here in the DFW area where I'm based for our World Education Congress event coming up in June. Mm -hmm. It's going to be in Grapevine, Texas at the Gaylord Texan. Mm -hmm. We're designing an incredible experience with quite a few surprises, uh, and we would love to have you join us to experiment. We like to say that we'll try new things, so you don't have to, like we were just oh, talking about. Nice. So we'll do. We'll take on the. We'll take on the risk. Uh, try some new things with us. How amazing! I love that. So basically, from our whole conversation, you're you're creating and designing an experience where people get to hear this and then go have the experience in, in real time. That would be, that's, that's my aim. That's awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh. I couldn't have planned that better. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> so everybody go check that out. I'll make sure we have the, the links for that in the show notes so that you can go and, and be a part of that. It's super exciting. So, and uh, so anyway, thank you so much. If anybody's listening and they're like, what in the world is that dinging? I have a, a messenger that's going off that, I couldn't figure out how to turn off and I didn't want him. I had to keep hanging on to every word that Jesse was saying because it was so good. So if you hear it dinging, just imagine those are angels getting their wings or another inspirational idea. <laughs> I was taking it as positive affirmation for the things I was saying. Yes, it's like, oh, that was genius. <laughs> oh, there it is again. That was genius. 
<laughs> That's brilliant. The stories we tell ourselves. That's right. <laughs> so Jesse states, thank you so much. This has been a true pleasure and I'm so excited uh, for uh, everything that you're going to bring to MPI in the new year and the new decade. Thanks so much for being a part of this program today. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for listening, everybody. Appreciate you as always. And uh, take the things that Jesse has shared with you because you can take this wisdom from her and apply it into your life as well. It doesn't really matter what you do or how you go through your day. You got to be in charge of the stories you tell. You got to be a leader of yourself and you want to create and design experiences that allow you to uh, get the most out of your day and, and create wonderful experiences for those around you. And, and for goodness sake, have some fun. Throw some fun in there, schedule some fun, and, uh, and it'll allow you to be a mesmerizing, sure success. Thanks so much, we'll talk to you soon. Have a great day. Hey, it's Tim Sure. Would you like to learn my best secrets for how to be mesmerizing? Then head over to www.survivingtothriving.me and download a free copy of my Mesmerizing Mindset Secrets. That's www.survivingtothriving.me. I'll see you there.